Hello everyone, welcome to Ejona Skills live webinar on moving from management to leadership. My name is Anushwa and I'm going to be your host today. On behalf of Ejona Skills team, I would like to thank you for being part of this event. Today's webinar will be presented by Carla Branchu. Carla is a leading authority on leadership for a more productive workforce. She mm -hmm. has educated managers with her proven leadership systems in companies such as Motorola, Coca-Cola Enterprises, uh, Panasonic, and BYD America. Over 85% of organizations who hire her invite her back for repeat engagement. Carla is a certified speaking professional, which is an earned designation given by National Speakers Association. We are very honored to have Carla with us. Before we begin, I would like to inform you about the program outlined for this training session. This webinar is for 60 minutes duration. First, Carla will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that would be covered, and then she share with you her presentation. We would like to inform to the attendees that they would be placed on mute as the session commences, and will remain so until the Q&A session that begins towards the end of the webinar. This is to make sure that the presenter's voice is clear to all our attendees and to avoid any unwarranted noise. We request you all to hold back your questions until the Q&A session is opened. A maximum of 10 minutes of time will be allotted for the Q&A, during which your questions will be taken and answered. If for any reason you get logged out of this training session or teleconference, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Now that we are all set to start this session, I, I request Carla to take it from here. Thank you very much, and I'd like to welcome you as well to our webinar today. Because you have joined us, I know that you're very brave, and I know that you have taken on a management position and probably in a leadership position, and I admire that you are willing to be open-minded and uh, learn some new concepts. It tells me that you're serious about your career. And I have many tips to share with you today. Um, as we, as the title says, as we move from management into leadership. So we're going to be talking about management and we're going to be talking about leadership, specifically about 21st century leadership. And it's based on my book, How to Earn the Gift of Discretionary Effort. So this is a discretionary effort leadership program and we're going to be talking about what discretionary effort is because it is a 21st century concept if you can uh, catch it and apply it to what you already know about 20th century management. And we'll be distinguishing that uh, just a little bit for you. So the first thing we have to answer is what is discretionary effort? And as a manager, why should you pursue it? So discretionary effort leadership means people choose to follow you. They don't have to follow you because of your place on the organizational chart. That is why you as a manager should pursue discretionary effort leadership. Because we know that people sometimes have to follow their manager and other times they choose to follow their manager because that manager has created an emotional commitment to them and to the company and has um, been able to create a loyalty with that employee. Now, why this is important to you at this point in time is because as our economy improves, which we are hoping it will continue to improve, as it improves, you know as a manager that people will think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence and they may start to uh, look for other jobs. So that's another reason why you want to become this manager that people choose to follow so you don't have to go through the rehiring and the retraining phase of, uh, of getting employees in your organization. Now discretionary effort, see if I can move the next slide here. Discretionary effort is a conscious free will choice that employees make on a daily basis. Meaning that when they come into work, when they come through those work doors, they don't know it, but unconsciously they're thinking, Hmm, how hard am I going to work today? So I think I need another cup of coffee. Should I go talk to Don about the coming office party? Uh, maybe, maybe I can wait to answer some of these emails. There's just so many in my inbox. Oh, I wonder if I should really be on time for that meeting or if I'll let them get over some of the, you know, the 
basic little things they always do, the superficial chit chat, and then I'll come in late. So they are asking all of those questions. And so they don't realize it, but they are deciding how much, quote, discretionary effort they are going to give to you that day. And this also applies whether they're working remotely or whether they're actually coming through your office doors. Now, discretionary effort is the difference between what an employee does to get a paycheck and what the employee is capable of contributing, meaning that employees have a certain level of things they have to do from their job description every week in order to get that paycheck. But they can be capable of contributing so much more if you as a manager know how to open the door of their mind, you might say, or open their heart or open their soul to helping you. Now, some people believe that discretionary effort is going the extra mile. And going the extra mile is part of it, but that's kind of a 20th century concept that has come to mean they're going to stay late. They might come on Saturday to make sure that the work is done for Monday morning. Uh, they will go extra miles. It, it, they will go the extra mile in some of those ways, the traditional ways. And when we talk about discretionary effort, it doesn't mean that they won't go the extra mile or going the extra mile isn't part of it. But discretionary effort is so much more. Because when they give you, or when you start to catch a concept of what discretionary effort is, you will see that employees will give you commitment. And I'm sorry, that word mirror is over on the arm of that, on the hand of that fellow over there. Yeah. They will give you commitment, not just mere compliance. In other words, if I'm working at a certain level where I am just absolutely doing the bare minimum to get my paycheck, I'm giving you compliance. But when I start to move into giving you discretionary effort, I'm giving you commitment as well. And it goes along with the next point there that I'm aligning with departmental objectives. You will be setting your departmental objectives, and I don't know, many of you may be uh, owners of companies uh, or in uh, upper management, so you know that the company will set the direction and the mission and the vision, and then the departments have to align with your vision and mission and directions and objectives. And what you want to do when people start to give discretionary effort to you is that they align with those departmental objectives, meaning they say, you know what, I can buy into this. Uh, this is part of my value system. I I'm going to be okay with this. And I'm going to make my daily product productivity align with these uh, objectives. So they start to give you mind share and they start to give you intellectual energy, meaning that they're going to give you some creativity. They're going to help you innovate, which is the next point there. And they have the uh, thought process or the, what we call the intellectual energy to give to you and to help you solve problems and to be creative and innovative in the marketplace with new products and services. And they start, with what, start to work with what I call a producer's mindset. Now, I've done a, a lot of time management training and producer's mindset means something special to me. But some people wonder what in the world I mean by producer's mindset. What I mean is that when I come to work and I sit down to do my work, I'm going to produce that day. I don't come into work to talk to my friends. I don't come into work to, you know, work on a side project. I don't come into work to surf the internet or whatever. I come in with a producer's mindset, meaning I am going to work hard today. And that also means that I have set that up the day before, meaning that I closed out my day the night before and I planned what I was going to do in certain time slots on the next day. To me, that's just a simple explanation of what a producer's mindset is. And if you can get the employees into this discretionary effort mode and living the things that I have talked about here, then they will seek to give exceptional customer service. And you understand that people will treat the customers the way they are treated. And so these steps and these things we're talking about are extremely important for you to be able to uh, give great service to your customers, keep them engaged with you, and keep them loyal to your company. Now, you cannot legislate or demand discretionary effort, but you can lead and you can manage employees in order to obtain it. And discretionary effort leadership is built on 21st century, it's a 21st century strategy that builds on successful 20th century 
engagement programs and engagement principles that may already be in place in your organization. But it takes you to a deeper level of recognition. And it focuses on intrinsic motivation, not extrinsic motivation. Now let's kind of pause for just a minute and go through some of the things that are managerial and some of the things that take us into leadership. Oh, if you've been a manager for even a month, you know that these things are what your responsibilities are. You have to plan the goals and objectives. You have to communicate to that employee the job expectations. You have to appraise their job results, monitor their productivity, conduct performance reviews, delegate effectively, supervise teamwork. And by the way, we will talk a little more about delegation as it moves into uh, the leadership, uh, disc discretionary effort leadership field. These are all really common and you say, yeah, yeah, I got that, I understand that. Then another part of management responsibilities are to ensure effective technology integration, address conflicting priorities, and as I say, if you're a manager with any type of manager title anywhere in the company, I admire you because it takes a brave person to uh, take on these conflicting priorities and the conflicts between employees. Uh, you're responsible for the objectives and the goals that are being met or exceeded, that's what we hope they do, or we hope that all of our employees will exceed the objectives and goals that are set out or the expectations. But then it comes to enforcing the policies and procedures and ensuring systems work correctly and disciplining employees. And uh, this picture, I've used it for years. Uh, some people in the, who live in the hierarchical environment, this is the way they see uh, their management, because sometimes management will uh, micromanage and the enforcement, enforcement becomes uh, a little like retaliation a little bit. And so uh, as we move into the uh, discretionary effort leadership, it doesn't mean that management, these management responsibilities go away. It just means that we start to see them in a little bit different light and we start to work with them in uh, different ways so that we can move employees and, and create this culture where employees are comfortable coming to work. Uh, they know that they're going to be uh, respected and that they're going to have, uh, that someone cares about them. And it's not all just about the discipline. Now, just a really short story about this. I was talking recently at a program I did with a, a woman who was only 10 months on the job as the uh, corporate office manager. And she was hired because for two years, the corporate office manager had really abused the employees that worked there. In fact, one employee, when uh, this new corporate manager called her in to the office to speak to her, was so afraid of coming in her office that she was literally shaken, shaking because of the experiences that she had had with the previous corporate manager. Of course, this manager intuitively understands many of the discretionary effort principles and has turned that unit around. So um, this is just one facet that you can think about that you want to avoid this kind of relationship with your employees. And I'm sure that none of you on the call have that uh, relationship. Now for just a little history lesson, if you've uh, been through an MBA program or any business programs, you may already know this, and so you can say, I knew that, Carla. And uh, the question is, how are you going to apply it here as you go forward as we learn about discretionary effort and as we move into leadership? Well, one of the things that started all of this, uh, you might say, trend towards leadership, not just strictly management, is the work of Frederick W. Taylor. In the 1880s, 1890s, and 1900s, the factories that were coming out of the agrarian economy were all built, or most of them were built on Frederick Taylor's ideas about scientific management. And he said that maximum productivity yields maximum prosperity, which I don't think any of us would disagree with that, except when you start to understand what he means by that. He says that employees should be scientifically selected. We can agree with that, right? Because we all get assessments that we want the best employees. They should be trained and they should be developed. We can agree with that. However, we might want to distance ourselves a little bit from Taylorism when he says that management should provide detailed instructions and concentrated supervision. Now, we can agree with that to a point, but if it comes to micromanaging, 
then uh, I think I'm going to step back and say, you know, I'm not sure about the micromanagement here. And, and you'll see why as we get into discretionary effort leadership, and you've probably already discovered that yourself. Because if you're micromanaging those employees, they're not getting to use their creative ability or their, their heads or their brains, you might say. Uh, and we hire them now for their brains, not for their brawn, which they were hired for their brawn in the early part of the, uh, of the 20th century. And so you want to start to separate this out a little bit and use some judgment here because Taylor also believed that managers plan, employees do. He didn't want the employees to think at all. He just wanted the managers to tell them what to do. And that, that doesn't really work in our 21st century, especially when we get into the millennials who uh, have their own ideas about how things should be done, and they have a lot of good ideas to add to us. And in fact, any employee has really great ideas. And the concept in today's world is that you, as a manager, can't possibly know everything. Because the world is moving so fast, there's so much technology going on, that you have to listen to all the team members. You have to be able to, uh, from all areas of your organization, you have to listen to them. Just a quick story about that. I was uh, working with a man in a PR firm, and he said that they were called into Sweden, uh, and the, the company didn't have a lot of money, but they had, uh, they had a line of bread that they wanted to promote. It was a new bread. And they'd asked this company, and they decided to take it on, even though it wasn't what they would usually get with an account. So they went over and sat down with the company, and it was the company's policy that they would have people from every department. Uh, every department would come to this meeting to decide how they were going to promote this new bread. So ideas were opened up, they were kicked around, and nothing seemed to hit right. And finally, just as they were about, you know, at exasperation without any really good ideas coming up, it kind of quieted down and the lady from the cantina, which was the lady from the cafeteria, said in a very quiet voice, why don't you put $100 bills in the bread sack? And they thought about it. They said, oh, that's kind of a silly idea. But my uh, colleague went back and thought about it all night. And he said, you know, I don't think there's any, I think that might be a pretty good idea. I don't think there are any laws against it. So he researched everything. And uh, they decided, they came up with the idea that they would go ahead and put a $100 bill in random sacks of uh, bread. You can imagine what happened when a few people opened a sack of bread and found a $100 bill, their bread was so popular. And the idea came from a woman in the cafeteria. And to me, that's a great example of why you have to reach out, you have to bring in the whole team, and you have to be able to listen to them in order to uh, coalesce ideas together, in order to synthesize, analyze, to be able to find out what is best for the marketplace and go forward. When, when managers will tell people what to do and the employees are supposed to do, as you can't imagine, this causes quite a bit of disengagement because employees are not being able to use their brains. And how do you spot a disengaged employee? Well, it's pretty easy. I had to laugh when I saw this picture because I think that young lady is pretty disengaged. So you can spot them. And you understand that people join companies because you have a lot of good things about your company, but they lead managers. And I believe it's because managers don't move into the leadership realm. They, uh, they don't move into this discretionary effort mode uh, that we're talking about today. And this is a graph that I really like, because when you hire an employee, they're very excited about it, and the management is involved uh, with their onboarding, they're involved with teaching them all about the company and getting them going in the right direction. Then when managerial involvement flatlines, employee engagement also decreases. And when we talk about emotional commitment, you'll see what happens at this stage because now the management are going like, the manager's going, did I, did I really hire the right person? Is this going to work? How are we going to get out of this? Because the manager can see that that employee is losing some enthusiasm and engagement for their job. 
but we have found that if you can keep engaging with the employee, or I like to call her keeping the grass watered on your side of the fence, if you can do that, uh, then the employee starts to get into that, uh, giving the gift of discretionary effort. And as you see, they can now ascend together into what we call authentic contribution and uh, the emotional commitment to the company, the rational alignment that has to go on. Now, as I said, a lot of these strategies are based on 20th century motivation. And I know you've all experienced it. 20th century motivation was built on money and things. It was extrinsic motivation uh, to the employee. It means it was built on badges and trophies and gold stars and points and rewards and incentive programs, gold watches. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been offered a set of pearls or Vera Bradley um, luggage, cameras. Once we got a ping pong table as an incentive, uh, from a catalog, uh, but you know, they've got luggage and musical equipment and all kinds of things that you can get as incentives if you will go the extra mile uh, and if you will give them, quote, what some people think of as discretionary effort. You also know that 20th century extrinsic motivation was built on fear. A lot of it was built on competing, making you compete with one another. Fear of failure, fear of punishment, fear of being fired. All of this was outside of the individual. And I must tell you that being motivated by a carrot or a stick doesn't really work like it did early on. Uh, people are kind of getting uh, a little tired of this. And by the way, some of what we call extrinsic motivations have now become entitlement. And they become that way if you're not careful the way they're administered. Now you can see that uh, th this website here, You Earned It, has some steps up there that I think were pretty important as we move into this area of discretionary effort and how you get it from employees. 69% of employees say they would work harder if they were better recognized. 52% say they're not satisfied with the level of recognition that they currently receive. 49% of employees say they would leave their current job for a company that clearly recognized employees for their efforts. And 39% of employees do not feel appreciated at work. Those are important words, and if I had you in a, an actual class, I would have you circulate, circulate, I'm sorry, circle those words, appreciated, recognized, because that's some of the key to gaining emotional commitment with your em employees. And of course, this website, you earned it, uh, most of it is built on, well, some of the things there are built on the intrinsic motivation and some of them are still on the extrinsic motivation. So uh, you might want to uh, check their website out. But you have to believe these, uh, these stats here. In fact, uh, there's a study that was done, and this was done several years ago. And you can find it when you research it on the web. But they researched what managers thought employees wanted and then they researched what employees said they wanted. Managers thought the best way to motivate the employees was to give them more money, where actually the employee said, we would like to be recognized. That's higher on our list. We would like to be appreciated and we would like to be thanked. Those were the things that the employees wanted from their managers. So take these things seriously as we move into talking about 21st century Intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic means it's within the, and inside the individual, it's within them. And what intrinsic motivation comes down to is that people want a little bit of autonomy to produce work. In other words, when I'm going to delegate to someone, I'm going to give them assignment, they need a little bit of autonomy to say, you know, you need to give it to them early enough so that they can work it into their schedule, so that they can, um, take control of, of how it's going to kind of lay out. Give them just a little bit of freedom to use their creativity. They want to belong to a group. And you know, feeling like you're with the in-group is a great motivator. I know because you're human and because you've worked in organizations, you can feel when you're in the in-group 
and when you start to slip out of the in-group. Slipping out or never belonging to the in-group can cause some internal uh, conflict. I know conflict probably isn't the right word, but internal in, in uh, a loss of self-esteem, I guess we could say it that way. It's like, am I really worth anything here? Is anyone, does anyone really care about me? So you want to make sure that your employees feel like they belong to a group. It could be a small group. It doesn't have to be many people, it could be a team, but they need to belong to something there in your organization. They have, they have a curiosity for improvement. In other words, the human psyche here loves to learn. Most people want to improve, and most people come to work wanting to do good work, wanting to climb the ladder, climb the career ladder, and be recognized for good things. It, it talks about intrinsic motivation is the mastery of concepts or processes and doing meaningful work. I know that you have experience uh, when you have, and, and by the way, one of the most invigorating experiences I ever had was working on a team where we all clicked. Everyone kind of knew what the other person was going to do, which reminds you uh, of a sports team. Uh, some of you have been on sports teams and, yeah, you know, I mean, gee, if I didn't have to go to this team, I wouldn't. Or you've been on teams where you said, oh, this is so exciting. And, and you can watch this in professional teams when they make it to their finals or to the uh, playoffs or whatever. People start to coalesce again. They feel like they're, they're mastering something, that they're part of this group. And the mind wants to do meaningful things. And so when the mind starts to do meaningful work that, that has value, then they feel they're intrinsically motivated to do more just like the teams that make it to the playoffs are intrinsically motivated to give discretionary effort and uh, perhaps go the extra mile again as far as staying late for practice. But the discretionary effort that happens in, uh, in your um, playoffs, you might say, I'm, I'm trying to get two analogies here, because you have the analogy of the, how exceptional sports teams win, it's that discretionary effort, the, the, the little decisions that they make, the discretionary effort to keep going when they're down. Uh, and I'd like to liken this to music, if any of you have a musical experience in your life. You know, some people can just play notes and it comes out okay. But other people, you listen to them and whether they're playing the guitar, the violin, the, uh, whatever they're doing, the piano, you say, wow, that really sounds wonderful. Well, those people that make it sound wonderful are adding their discretionary effort to the phrase. Uh, they're adding it to the tempo. They're adding it to whatever is happening in that music. They're putting their soul into it. Or in other words, they love their work. And you can see this if they love their work, no matter what it is. You know, we talk about athletics and we talk about the arts, but, but people who love their work, some people love statistics, some people love finance. Some people love finding the mistakes that are happening. They're, they're great proofreaders. I mean, there's all kinds of gifts and talents that uh, go around that are intrinsic. And when they do what they love to do, and by the way, which brings us to the discussion of strengths and limitations, if you can find the strengths of your people and let them work in those, which is a whole other webinar that we can do, then uh, they are working at discretionary effort and they're blossoming in their strengths where, where they know that they are good and they can improve. I got this off of LinkedIn. I don't know why that header was cut off, but I loved what it said because it says you can buy a man's time, you can buy a man's physical presence at a given place, you can even buy a measured number of skilled muscular motions per hour or day, which was happening in the Ford factories. But you cannot buy enthusiasm. You cannot buy initiative. You cannot buy loyalty. You cannot buy the devotion of hearts, minds, and souls. You have to earn these things. And that's why we called our book, You Have How to Earn the Gift of Discretionary Effort. Because when you earn that gift, you're earning their initiative, they're earning their loyalty, you're earning their conviction, their commitment to you, uh, the, the devotion, you might say, of their souls. And that's our goal with discretionary effort. Now, I love this cartoon. It was given to me by a dear friend many, many years ago. He says, good work, Ben, but I think we need a little more detail right here. And he has penciled in, then a miracle occurs. Now, how I liken this is that you know a lot of management principles. You've got a lot of stuff in your head. 
And you know what you want out on a certain day. You know you've got all these interactions that you have with, who have with people. And then you say, well, hopefully a miracle will occur and I'll get through all of this and we'll have a solid team here. But um, as we take this miracle, you might say, the miracle is moving into 21st century leadership, which means it's the way you're making decisions. It's the way you're delegating. It's the way you're optimizing the collaboration and synergy on the team. It's the way that you're ensuring all members of the team are heard, that you can listen to them. It's helping to engage and stimulate their personal initiative. What we were talking about is intrinsic motivators. It's your job in 21st century leadership to be a culture change agent, to maintain the focus on objectives, to provide intellectual stimulation for them, and to provide a situational awareness and flexibility because remember the example of a person who just gets up and plucks out the notes on the keyboard? It's not as pretty as someone that has the situational awareness or can, can flex to what's happening and add nuances to that music. And you want to model best practices. And this is what we call being the leader of one. We'll talk just a little more about that. But as you model the way you want your employees to treat each other and the way you want the employees to work towards your goals and your objectives, then you are modeling the practices and they, as a committed employee, will follow you. Hopefully. We know there's some that will never make it up there, but there are some really great ones that will. Now, before we talk a little more about the um, discretionary effort pyramid, I want to just touch on a few more manager to leadership things, which is, number one, you want to refine your delegation skills, which means that you're getting work done through others. And as I talk to managers, there's, uh, we know all the resistance that people have towards delegating. You know, they say, oh, my people are so busy, and they finally get down to the truth, I can do it better myself. But there's a real skill to delegating, and there's a need that you delegate, uh, and, and new managers especially have to learn this, uh, because you can't keep doing all the things that you have to do and still motivate other people and get them going. Now, why I have the picture of the guy with the monkey on his back relates to an article by William Onken that was in the Harvard Business Review several years ago, and you can find it online, and I recommend that you go online and, and read it. You'll have to update the mindset a little bit because it didn't have the uh, 20th century focus on some of the concepts, but the basic concept is absolutely brilliant because it talks about the manager that comes in in the morning and one of the employees come up and say, oh, you know, we have a problem. Now, your, your ears should perk up when it says, we have a problem. And so he says, well, let me look at it. And as William Monken describes this, the monkey just jumped from the employee's back to the employer or to the manager's back. If two or three employees come and say that, then pretty quick, the manager has all the monkeys on his back and he's trying to make all the decisions. Now, we have some uh, help for that problem, but you ought to go look at that article. One of the helps is this BA, and it doesn't mean bad attitude, but it means bring answers. So when uh, your employees come to you and they say, we have a problem, then you say, well, would you something to this effect? Well, I need you to study that out and bring me the pros and cons and tell me what you think I should or what we should do about it. And that will keep the monkeys on their batch and give you time to really lead. And we understand that delegating responsibility and authority is important. And as your managerial, uh, as you see this graph, there's a time where employees should be given responsibility and accountability and be empowered. And you need to be clear and specific about this path for them and clear and specific when you delegate to them. Because as, as employees become empowered, then your managerial power is going to increase and you will look better throughout all of the organization because they will only make you look good. Now, in the, uh, the trust factor here is important because you want to tell them why and I'd, if we were together, I would say circle that why. And you want to point them in the right direction, but you want them to figure out how. 
meaning that uh, in the state of Georgia here, if I want them to take something across town for me, there are a lot of different roads they can take. So I'll say, I need this to go to, you can decide how. Now there are shorter routes, but sometimes those routes are blocked up, so you have to have additional and alternate routes. So you want them to use their brains and figure out how. So you give them the overall picture and direction, clear instruction on the desired outcome, timelines for follow-up check-ins and many reviews, because you do have to have those. And one of the reasons you do that is because if you're checking in with the employee, they feel valued, they feel like someone's interested in them. Because remember the lines that we had in the graph um, earlier, if you stop making contact with them, then their engagement goes down or they feel disengaged from what's happening. But it's just that little contact that's important to know that they're still important and they're going in the right track. And then you need to be very clear on the final deadline. Now there are some levels of accountability and responsibility in a delegation. And of course the first one for a new employee is do exactly as I say. Do exactly what I showed you to do, either way. Then the next level is look into this and tell me what you think about it, what you can come up with and I'll decide. And the next level is give me some options, list the pros and cons of each, and then we'll make a decision about whether to go forward. Then the next level is decide and let me know your decision and go ahead unless I say not to. You see how the trust is uh, increasing with that employee. And then I love this last level. It says, take care of it for me, then tell me what you did. That's a great level to get to with your employees to have built that trust. And by the way, it, it, that trust doesn't happen just it doesn't happen easily, it takes time. It takes a lot of training to be able to show the uh, employee and to build their expertise level so that you can trust them. I want you to recognize efforts and show gratitude. So after they've worked hard for you, after you've delegated this and they've come through um, at any of these stages of delegation that we talked about in the previous slide, you need to be able to thank them. You need to be able to email them write a real thank you note like it shows here. Uh, you need to be able to sometimes send them something, uh, give them tickets to something, you know, we can go back to all those 20th century engagement techniques that work. They really work with the thank you here as well. But the main thing is that you want to say thank you. You want to show gratitude and you want to recognize those efforts. It was quite a day. I remember distinctly when I asked a colleague of mine, as we were talking about thank yous and gratitude, I said, have, have you ever been thanked by, by a manager? And his face kind of went blank and it was several seconds. I'd like to say a whole minute, but it, it seemed like an hour. And he finally said, no, no, I've never had a thank you from a manager. If you can show gratitude and recognize the effort you will get more discretionary effort out of that employee. In fact, I had one young lady say, I live for great job. And every time I get great job, I go out and I work twice as hard to get the next great job. So just recognizing them, being grateful for what they do, thanking them is powerful to move into the area of getting discretionary effort from them. Now this is the Ross Brasso Discretionary Effort Leadership Model. I have a co-author named Douglas Ross, and this is the leadership model that we came up with. So you work the environment of integrity and gratitude, which we've been talking about. And we'll talk just a little more about integrity. We've just covered some of the things on, on uh, gratitude. And then as you move up this pyramid, you want to make sure that they have safety and security in your organization. And safety and security are interesting because safety usually refers to what's happening inside the building, meaning we have ergonomic chairs for them, uh, we're concerned about the steps that are not slipping down them, uh, the bathrooms are kept clean, uh, we do what we can to not have communicable diseases going around in flu season. And security generally is outside. In other words, I have uh, lights in the parking lot I have um, a security guard that's going to make sure no one comes bursting in and does damage here. 
then in a second we'll talk about other areas of the safety and security. But as you go up the pyramid, then you want social acceptance for people. And uh, this comes about as you accept people as they are, is what I like to say. Then you come to the rational alignment that we have already alluded to, and you come to the, and if you could do these first three levels correctly, then you get to emotional commitment. And when they start to give you emotional commitment and come on board with the whole organization and what's happening here, and they say, I can align with this rationally, I can align with it emotionally, then you start to get what we call authentic contribution from them where they actually become partners with you in making sure that the uh, organization goes forward. So let's discuss these levels in just a little more depth. Integrity. Oprah Winfrey said it well. She said, real integrity is doing the right thing, knowing that nobody's going to know whether you did it or not. And in your company, there are so many decisions to be made. And if you can work extremely hard to be able to be consistent in what you're telling people, they will say that you are in integrity. If you will plan and work hard to do the right thing and teach your people to do the right thing, then do the next right thing, and do the next right thing as all of these decisions unfold, you will find that you will have an organization of integrity. And some people get nervous about this and they say, well, you know, I mean, and the, and the reason I say this is because we're not computers, we're not Bibles, we're not robots. We make mistakes as human beings. And as a manager, you will make mistakes. And so you can say that you're out of integrity there, but how you get back in integrity is to admit what you did or to recognize it and say, you know, I didn't do quite so well on this or I made a mistake on this. Uh, or I apologize for da 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 da. And then you come back into integrity. I hope that uh, explanation is good for you and you can implement that in your uh, work. Now, when we talk about uh, safety and security, the other part of safety and security is that you care about the employees as a human being. You care about each employee as a human being. And you're concerned with their individual well being. And what this does is give them the stability. It's going back to Maslow's pyramid, which I see, which you could probably see that our pyramid uh, represents a little bit, which it does, and we intended that because people are familiar with uh, Maslow's pyramid. But it makes them feel safe, and when they feel safe, uh, they can work harder for you. People cannot work hard if they're continually worrying about their safety. Or, and that's why you don't want to use fear of firing people as a motivation because they're uh, worried about being fired. They're not worried about innovating, using creativity, and giving you intellectual mind share. So you can tell that uh, there's this, a wide range of uh, factors that come into this person that you've hired, and it, we call this the quality of life that you want to be concerned about for each employee. And uh, the next point of safety and security that I like to talk about is the psychological safety uh, because we all know what it feels like to be put down. And to have discretionary effort in your company, you have to be able to have interpersonal risk taking. You have to have the team safe to admit errors, to discuss the way forward. You have to be able to operate in this climate of openness, and you have to be able to have interdependence between them. You have to be able to have psychological safety so that they can brainstorm things, so that they can put ideas out there and not be put down for those ideas or made fun of. So you want to, as I was talking before about integrity, with this philosophy you want team members to be able to acknowledge that I made a mistake and realize that they're accountable. We're not taking that away, but understand, as I said, we're not Bibles, we're not robots, and we're certainly not computers, and we do make mistakes. So. Uh, kind of think about how that replies, uh, applies to the safety and security. Now, social acceptance, I love to talk about uh, because social acceptance means that I accept you as an employee, and I'm going to use a term that hopefully you will like, because it means I accept you as is. We did a good job hiring. We did all the different uh, assessments on you. Um, and we did everything we could to get the right employee for this. Now, I'm going to accept you where you are, and then I'm going to help you grow. Now, the uh, little 
anecdote that I would share with this is many of you may have decided to buy a new appliance. Uh, perhaps you want a new washer and dryer, and you go to the scratch and dent section of the store, and as you look at the scratch and dent section, you see a great washer, uh, all the features you want, but it has a dent on the side, and you say, no problem, it'll be against the wall. So you buy that washer, you take it home, and you have gotten great value for your money. Now, the same way when you hire an employee, they're going to have, because everybody has a scratch or a dent somewhere. <laughs> and so you accept that employee as is, and then you help them grow, and you help them gain skills, and you help them gain knowledge. Now, many of you may have used the TTI behaviors and driving courses assessment, and we use that in our training. And the main point of this is to let people understand their strengths and their limitations, because every single human being has strengths, and every human being has limitations. And your job as a manager, especially when it comes to discretionary effort, is to get that employee to know that employee so well that you know their strengths, so that you can put them in the right place on a team, so that you can put them in the right place on uh, a project that's coming up, so that you can use their talents or their gifts or their strengths that we call them when a problem arises. Because these talents and gifts, as I was mentioning or alluding to before, some of them are really good at finding errors. Some of them are really good at analyzing, uh, at analyzing situations. Some of them are really good at reading the group conversation. And when you know their strengths, then you can key in and you can use them to help you become better. In fact, I did a program uh, just last week, and uh, the two people that were the main people that hired me, one was a high CS, if you understand what that is, it means they're conscientious and they're uh, highly uh, skilled at being methodical in their work and thinking through problems. And the other one was a high a, a dominant and a high influencer. And so they were asking me, because they had a new president in the company, and they said, how can we use our skills to make this man be successful as president of the company? And it was easy for me to tell the, uh, the one that was DI that he could be the stem winder for the president because of his influence skills and that he could help the uh, manager make, the new president make decisions because the new manager didn't have as high uh, D or uh, as dominant or as high yellow. So those were two skills that he could give this new president. And the other person uh, was really good at thinking through things, analyzing, coming up with the, just exactly the right tidbits of information. And I said, you could use this to keep that president out of trouble because there's always, air, there's always places where people are going to question you and question what happened and you need someone that's very detailed oriented and the other one could add that. So those are some ways that you can use uh, the strengths that people have. And of course, we also help overcome strengths when we understand the limitations. I'm sorry, we help overcome limitations when we understand the strengths that other people have. Now we come to rational alignment as we're going up, and you have to clarify the visions, the values, objectives, and goals, and you have to connect that present to the future. And rational alignment also helps you clarify misunderstandings that people might have and point them in the right direction. And what I mean by that comes out in this uh, cultural integrity graph that I made for you here. Because it's the leader, the manager's responsibility to stabilize a shifting balance of power. And uh, I got that from one of the uh, past presidents of AT&T. He was speaking, and he said that there's a shifting power, and I think we can feel that in the economy now, because there's a shifting power between the uh, between management and between employees. Because, you know, when it's a, a, a down economy, then the managers have all the power, and when there's an up economy, economy, the employees have all the power. So there's this shifting thing that goes on almost, depending on what's happening in the world. Now, the superior environment for relationships and discretionary effort means that both the leader has a responsibility and the employee has a responsibility. And you can uh, study this graph a little more. I, I know you're going to download these slides and, and look at it because the manager, as the, as the manager moves into leadership, they're informing them, meaning that uh, now a manager would just inform you of what the person needs to know. Um, a manager working in the discretionary effort would give you the whole vision, would give you the big picture. And the reason that's important 
is because many times if people are using their creativity, they might get a little off because their, their creativity is taking them in one direction, but the objectives and goals are going down another line. So you want to give them the big picture so they can understand and self-correct. And then you have planning. If, you, uh, if I'm just planning by myself and then telling people what to do, I'm not getting the buy-in, uh, meaning that if we get people in a room and we get them all to talk about what's happening, and then we go forward. Now, the uh, power and trust is another thing that we can talk about because many people, many managers in the, just the manager mode of the 20th century thinks that, think that I have all the power, and if I give any of that power away, then my power is less. But that's not true because when you give power away, those people are going to be uh, even more engaged with you, and uh, they will help you look better in front of the whole organization, and you don't have to do all the work when you give some of the power away and delegate properly. Then you have trust, uh, the factor, and you have the motivation factor and the respect factor, and if you respect the people as individuals and as human beings, then they will trust you, and they will be motivated by the way you treat them. Now you can see that the leader can, is, has to give continuous training and development of the employees, and the employee's responsibility is to learn and clarify. And then you can go through that and see that, uh, that one of the main things that the leader has to do is to provide the target, the focus on the goal. Then you also notice that one of the things he does is to give relevant follow-up, feedback, and praise. So look at that graph, download it, and uh, kind of circle the things that maybe if you're training other managers that they might be able to use. Now, when it comes to the rational alignment, too, I love this um, pyramid again. I've used it several, several ways, as you can see, because you have the company vision, values, mission, goals, and objectives at the bottom, and then you move up to departmental long-term goals and objectives. And the reason this is important is because then the employee can integrate objectives into their personal planning. And then the manager and employee can have checkpoints, midpoints to make sure that they're still on track, to make sure that they see this overall picture, or to check in and say, you know what, the direction has changed a little bit, we need to go this way. And that affects the daily productivity of the employee. And then I've divided this also into strategic and to tactical, because we know there's strategic thinking, thinking about where the overall picture is and where we're going. And then there's tactical planning, meaning that I'm going to put these into goals and I'm going to start putting them on my to-do list. So download that and look at it and help your employees distinguish between strategic and tactical because you're helping them do the strategic, but they're doing the tactical to put it on their to-do list. Now we come to emotional commitment. And as I said, the emotional commitment is a step beyond their engagement. And uh, it makes possible this value by the solution because if they're giving you discretionary effort, they're going to be adding value to what's happening and to the decisions that are made. And by the way, it's a retention strategy because remember, as I said, when they gain emotional commitment or they are loyal to you, and uh, then they're going to stay with your organization. And by the way, gratitude increases emotional commitment. So there are stages of emotional commitment, and we don't have time to delve into these in great detail, but I think you recognize them because when the uh, employee first comes into your company, there's this huge potential, and there's this honeymoon uh, with them where everything's great. Then reality sets in that, you know, there's problems to solve here, and work is really work, isn't it? And there's some disconnect that happens. Remember that graph that I showed at the first because now they're into this uh, some, if the manager's not totally involved in that and, and understanding what's happening at this stage, there's some disconnect going on with the employee, like, oh, is this really what I signed on for? I didn't think it was going to be like this. And there starts to be a little disengagement there. Now, if the um, manager can get involved, get involved in this, quote, disengagement that's going on and bring them back, then there's going to be some harmony in there. Uh, and there's going to be optimization. And back to a little bit of the music things, if you've done anything in music, you know that there's chords and then they resolve into, uh, into the final chord. And so there's a resolution in music and there's a resolution that always happens because no matter where you are, there's going to be some type of discord in your organization. And then you get to the optimization that can happen as you go through these steps. Now, one, uh, I'd like to give you some advice from Bill George. 
He says that organizations filled with empowered teams and collaborative employees focused on serving customers, that's important, will outperform the hierarchical top-down organizations every time. Then he says that top-down leaders may achieve near-term results. Near-term, did you catch that? But only authentic leaders can galvanize the organization to sustain long-term performance. And the word there that I've highlighted in red is authentic, and I should have highlighted near-term, and I should have highlighted long-term, because discretionary effort is a long-term performance measure uh, that you can do for long-term results. And authenticity means that often it's buried beneath the layers of the getting along facade. And uh, when you're authentic, you have integrity, you're admitting some of your mistakes that you have, you're telling people what you really feel, uh, and I know you have to be a little careful with that because sometimes you can't be totally transparent. But you're not trying to hide things or have hidden agendas from them. And which goes into the next slide here that kind of uh, summarizes that. It says the authentic leader is self-aware, understands emotional intelligence, which we don't have time to go into today. But they have values and strengths and they also have limitations and they recognize those. Uh, the authentic leader can abandon hidden agendas and definitely refuses to play games. It's, the authentic leader is objective and fair-minded and has an ethical core about him or her. When this happens, then you're going to get authentic contribution from your employees. And it goes back to some of the ideas where we were talking about is that authentic contribution makes potential energy and achievement actual meaning that when that employee comes into your company, uh, they have huge potential and they have huge energy. And as you are authentic with them, then they become authentic with you. And realize that this energy is renewable. It's like when we talk about renewable, uh, renewable energy, you've got the sun and the wind. It's not, like the, it's not like the coal and the oil. But it is renewable inside of employees, and that's what keeps them going, what keeps them engaged and keeps them going for higher and higher goals in your company. And uh, when you have this going on, then you are definitely releasing the renewable discretionary effort of employees on a regular basis. So that's a Ross Brondo discretionary effort leadership model. And uh, once I, again, I would recommend you download the slide and study it and say, how is this applying in my organization? And you are the one, can I uh, make that? This is our other book that we have called The Leadership of One. And it means that you are the one, you are the manager that, you're the only one that can intrinsically motivate employees. I don't think a robot's gonna do very good at that. So you are indispensable as a manager. And we can say here that the leadership of one means that I take responsibility for my own personal growth, uh, professional growth, and then I model that professional behaviors, including the integrity, collaboration with people, authenticity with people, and productivity with people. And I extend to them dignity and respect, and this leads us to a human-led value system, meaning that I'm concerned about the employees in my organization. I can, I'm concerned about their well-being, and I, because I know and I understand that if they're going to be happy as an individual, then there's going to be a better atmosphere in my company. And a company of happy individuals is certainly a company where you have discretionary effort going on. So use these principles to be a 21st century discretionary effort leader. That is my wish for you today. So are there questions now? I think you can open it up for that. Are you there, uh, Emma? Are you there? Is our moderator there? We may have lost her. Is our moderator there? Are there questions? I apologize, I think we've lost our moderator. But you're welcome to email any questions you have. You can send them to this uh, company that uh, hired you. 
uh, I mean, that you joined this webinar for, and I will try to answer them for you. Hello. Oh, there you are. I just wanted you to check in and see if there were questions from anyone. Yes, Carla. Uh, thank you so much, Carla, for the session. Uh, thank you to participants for cooperating with us. It's the time for Q&A session to begin. We request the attendees who have questions for our uh, presenter, Carla, to share it with me by chat, and I shall pass it to our presenter to answer it. Anybody have any question? There is a message from Miguel Rossi. Uh, she is thanking you for, and she is saying a very good training. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, attendees, do you have any questions? Uh, okay, uh, there is a question. Oh, no, oh, no question from him. Oh, sorry, her query. Uh, from Kerry Looper, uh, she is saying big thanks to Carla. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here today with you. We will wait for another two minutes. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask to Carla. If you uh, if you have any questions uh, you want to ask by phone, uh, I can open the line. Hello. Uh, Kerry, are you there? Hello. Hello, Kerry. Uh, Kerry, are you there? You can ask the question directly to Carla. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mark. Uh, 
Uh, can you hear me? Okay, Carla, uh, I think uh, our attendees. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, another question from. Okay, uh, she's saying uh, she's still there, but have no questions. So, uh, okay. Uh, we'll wrap up the show now. So, uh, thank you so much, Carla, for the insightful session. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, thank you to all the participants for cooperating with us. It's a big thanks from uh, from uh, Ichona Skills. We are very grateful to all of you having taken part in this webinar. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email to webinars at the compliance dot com. If any of you feel that your team members or colleagues or friends might get benefited from this webinar, we are happy to inform you that it will be available in the recorded format and can be purchased from our website or you can call us at 717-208-8666. As we end this session now, we sincerely request you to share your feedback. In the feedback form that will be shared with you along with the certification email. In an endeavor to maximize the customer satisfaction, your feedback will help us to enhance the satisfaction level. We look forward to having you with us again sometime soon for your continued fruitfulness. On behalf of our presenter Carla and the compliance kit team, I would like to say big thanks for the for participating in the webinar and we wish you a pleasant day ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carla. Thank you very much. Goodbye.